Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. Yes, my name is Marco. I put the slides on uh, on my Twitter uh, hashtag uh, #PyParis. You know the drill. Uh, so, I'm a data scientist. I'm based in London, uh, and I work mostly with uh, with Python. So, uh, kind of naturally. Let's try again. Nothing happens. So naturally, I got involved uh, with uh, uh, PyData London, which is our uh, local uh, PyData chapter. Um, I'm one of the organizers. We have a nice uh, meetup once a month uh, and a nice conference once a year. Now, as an organizer of PyData, I notice a lot of people know about PyData, but not many people know about NumFocus. Uh, NumFocus is the no-profit organization behind uh, all the PyData events uh, worldwide, and they support financially many of the open source projects in, uh, in the PyData ecosystem. What, who? You got a new one. Thank you. Maybe you know that Sylvan is now on the board of directors for NumFocus, so you can ask him about uh, NumFocus. Uh, yeah, as an organizer also, I'm happy to uh, tell you that we have dates for uh, kind of the next year conference. So. Uh, if you want to ask me about PyData London, we, we can have a chat later. So, on to the topic of uh, this presentation, natural language generation. Um, just to put uh, things in context, looking at the bigger picture, usually we talk about natural language processing as, uh, as a broader uh, topic. And uh, in natural language processing, essentially, we have uh, two main pillars. Natural language understanding on one side, and natural language generation on the other side. Essentially, we're going from uh, human language to some sort of machine representation. That's our understanding. And then on the other side, from this machine representation back to uh, the human. And uh, we often use acronyms, NLP, NLG, NLU. So it's quite easy to slip. Uh, probably I'll do the same. So the topic here is NLG. But often, we kind of talk about NLP in general. So don't get confused. Now, drilling down to the, uh, this idea of natural language generation as a simple definition for the task. Uh, that's the task of generating natural language, human language, from some sort of machine representation. So probably the machine representation is going to be quite important. And I want to give you some uh, examples of applications first uh, of uh, natural language generation. So Common example is a summary generation. Let's say you have a big pile of documents. It's too much to read. So you analyze the documents. You have this machine representation. And then you use uh, NLP or NLG techniques to uh, distill uh, the information from uh, all these documents. And you end up with a short, uh, nice uh, summary, easy to read for the human. Another example of application is uh, weather report uh, generation. So imagine you have some sort of uh, weather forecast, uh, trying to predict uh, temperature, uh, humidity, whatever. Rather than showing uh, a dry table of numbers to the user, uh, you can use uh, NLG techniques to um, come up with uh, a uh, more, uh, more human, more uh, kind of user-friendly type of report. So instead of uh, showing the table of temperature, you can say, uh, for today, we expect some war warmer weather and uh, for the rest of the week as well. And the idea is that you can uh, probably apply the same concept uh, to many other uh, uh, verticals. So rather than showing a table of numbers, uh, kind of a show a narrative uh, to the user, more uh, user-friendly, kind of improving the user experience. Another type of application is uh, Automatic journalism. Now, when we talk about automatic journalism, sometimes it's a bit controversial. Uh, on one side, it sounds like we want to replace journalists. Uh, that's not the case. We want to kind of support journalists. Just like uh, you use uh, uh, spell checkers to um, um, improve your work when you write, you could also use some sort of a, uh, automatic text generation technique to get some prompts um, about what you're writing. Also, on the other side, uh, one of the negative aspects of uh, generating text uh, on a large scale automatically is the uh, full story about uh, misinformation, so fake news, uh, fake reviews, and whatnot. Of course, that's, that's something to consider. So uh, I guess knowing about uh, 
the technology will also help you to uh, fight uh, essentially the, the fake news phenomenon. One more example, uh, all the buzz with the virtual assistants, um, conversational agents, or how they call it nowadays, chatbots. So Siri, Cortana, and uh, the uh, Google Assistant. You have it on your phone, essentially. Uh, you have it on the website of your bank. Uh, and maybe you notice how this type of chatbots tend to work quite well when the um, domain is, uh, is narrow. So if you have a clear kind of a task, uh, you know, you want to set a timer or you want to know about the weather, the conversation with the agent uh, goes quite well. If you try to talk about life and uh, everything and about philosophy and whatnot, sooner or later this type of uh, um, assistants will, uh, will get confused and uh, they get stuck in a loop, essentially. So that was just a bit of an overview in terms of applications. Now, moving towards natural language generation, uh, I want to introduce language modeling first. So language modeling is uh, something we've been doing for, for quite a while uh, these days, and uh, that's about uh, creating a language model. So again, with simple definitions first, uh, a language model is essentially a model that gives you the probability of uh, a sequence of words, the probability of a string, essentially. What do we want from uh, a language model? We want to capture aspects of the language. So for example, uh, in terms of uh, word order, you would say, I'm going home. You don't say, home I'm going, unless you are massively drunk and start talking about, uh, start talking like uh, Master Yoda. So word order is important. So you want to capture this aspect of the language in the language model, and uh, you want the probabilities to reflect uh, these aspects of the language. Another aspect of the language is the choice of words. So for example, in uh, some languages like uh, Italian, German, uh, uh, Spanish, probably French as well, you have one word for home and house. So when you translate from these languages into English, you essentially have a choice. Do I use home or do I use house? Uh, well, you say I'm going home. You don't say I'm going house. So again, you want the language model to capture this aspect of choosing the right word, uh, depending on the context. And you want the probabilities to uh, reflect uh, these aspects. So how do we get there? Uh, we start uh, from uh, randomness. So there's a thing called the infinite monkey theorem. It's a real thing. Uh, the infinite monkey theorem says uh, if you put a monkey in front of a typewriter, given enough time, uh, sooner or later you will see the uh, whole work of Shakespeare. So the monkey will type something and then you will see Shakespeare coming up. Given enough time, that's important. Uh, just for color, about 15 years ago, some researchers from uh, a university in, uh, in Devon, in uh, southwest England, they actually tried to implement the infinite monkey theorem. They put uh, a keyboard in a, in a cage with some monkeys. The monkey started typing. It was going well at the beginning. And then the alpha male took over, uh, smashed the keyboard, uh, urinated on the keyboard, and, and whatnot. So they call it a success anyway, because they, uh, they realized, well, monkeys are not random. So how do we implement the infinite monkeys? You could just do a random choice on uh, all the printable uh, characters. So from string import printable will give you uppercase, lowercase, numbers, uh, punctuation, and so on. And then we can argue, is the monkey going to hold the shift key to do the uppercase? Well, we don't really know. Uh, but in principle, you can give it a go. And uh, I tried a few times. Uh, it's really random. so. That's the output. You don't see any Shakespeare. I've run it many times, more times than I'm willing to admit, and I didn't see any, any Shakespeare or any English word at all. So that's probably not going to work. If you want something a bit more meaningful, uh, we can introduce this notion of uh, engrams. Engrams are, uh, again, as a simple definition, a sequence of n items taken from uh, a sample of text. If you want to do engrams in Python, there's a nice library called NLTK, the Natural Language Toolkit, very good for, uh, for learning about natural language processing and whatnot. They implement uh, the engrams function. So here I'm taking the engrams of the word pizza, and I fix uh, n equal 3. 
So a sequence of three. And if I run this one, you see uh, that we have essentially a sliding window going left to right, P, I, Z, I, Z, Z, and so on. And because the input uh, was a single uh, word, a string, uh, this is uh, a character-based engram. So you can do engrams on individual characters. Another example, here you have uh, a, a longer string, a sentence. I split it, so essentially I will have uh, a list of words. If you do uh, engrams here, when you have a list, uh, you still have this notion of sliding window, but this will be based on words. So uh, using two for, uh, for n, you see the quick, quick brown, and then you carry on with the sliding window. And that's called the word-based bigram. So bigrams, three grams, four grams, n grams. So how do we go from n grams to language models? Uh, given a big chunk of text, uh, so you have uh, a, lot of, a lot of text data, you find all the engrams, and then uh, you come up with the probabilities. And it can be as simple as counting the, the uh, engrams. So for example, if you want to do bigram-based probabilities, what is the probability of uh, the string uh, brown fox? Uh, you can uh, model it as a conditional probability of uh, observing fox as next word given the word brown. And this can be computed, uh, as you see, on a frequency-based probability. So counting the occurrences of brown and fox together as a joint uh, probability, and then normalize over the condition. And you can make it as complex as you like, but that's kind of a, a simple starting point, just counting words. To give you an example of uh, actual implementations of uh, um, this type of engram-based probabilities, uh, in your smartphone you already have some sort of predictive text uh, technology. So this is uh, a screenshot from my, um, from my Android, I'm writing an email, and uh, as I'm typing something, the system will uh, suggest uh, the most likely next word, so depending on what you type, uh, you can essentially tap your, uh, your keyboard and uh, the mobile will complete uh, the sentence for you. Now, as, a, as an exercise, uh, you can take your phone, uh, take your phone, and uh, either open an email or, uh, or a WhatsApp or whatever, and you start typing. You can use your name or you can use mine. Uh, maybe you have the autocomplete in French, uh, so translate as you see fit. So essentially, if I start typing, Marco is, uh, and then I go tap, 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 kind of next word, next, next, next. I would like to see, uh, I don't know, maybe my, my LinkedIn profile coming up or my, my CV, something like that. So I give you a moment, just start tapping and see what happens. What's happening? Very well. So, well, this is what happens when I do it. So I type Marco is, and then I go with the autocomplete. So Marco is a good time, okay, <laughs> to get uh, the latest Flash player is required for video playback is unavailable right now because this video is not sure if you have a great day. And um, yeah, all right then. <laughs> Very good. So. What's going on here? Uh, well, if you read it, it, you know, from time to time you have a little, uh, a little phrase that is fluent, you know, verb and noun and so on. But then in the, in the bigger context, it doesn't make sense at all, right? So um, it looks grammatical locally, but globally it doesn't make any sense. That's what typically happens. So one of the limitations here uh, of uh, using engram-based language modeling if you want to use the full uh, context, the global context, or the full history, to predict the next word, uh, this is going to be too computationally expensive. So essentially what people do, uh, they just uh, narrow down the context, they use uh, only the few previous words uh, to make the context uh, smaller and, uh, and therefore the computation more feasible. Meaning we only consider local context, so there is a lack of uh, notion for a global context. That's why you see uh, this fluctuation of a phrase that makes sense locally, and then uh, in the longer phrase, in the longer sentence, there is no sense at all. So lack of global context. Now, fast forward, uh, we've been working on language models for, for a few decades, and uh, 
more recently, uh, we have seen uh, a lot of uh, big improvements, uh, especially coming from the neural network sides. So I give you a one minute introduction to neural networks in case you're not familiar. And then we talk about neural networks applied for applied to natural language techniques. So with neural networks, you have uh, essentially a family of algorithms that you can represent graphically as a network with nodes and, uh, and connections between nodes, nodes and edges. You have layers, input, output, and uh, anything in the, in the middle is called a uh, hidden layer. When you zoom in uh, to a particular node uh, that is called a neuron, uh, what, what's going on inside uh, the node? So the node will have a bunch of inputs. All the inputs will have uh, weights. And what the neuron is doing is doing a weighted sum of the inputs. So all the inputs uh, multiplied by the weight and then sum everything together. And this is thrown inside uh, a function. Uh, what kind of function? Well, it's up to you. Uh, you can implement uh, different types of functions. Uh, people who work in neural networks typically kind of like a family of functions here, but uh, theoretically you could use any kind of function. And when we say we train the network to do something, what we really mean is uh, uh, the following. We start with uh, some sort of a random initialization for the weights, and then we run our inputs through the network. Given the output, we can uh, uh, consider some notion of error. Uh, that's also called loss function or uh, objective function. And the purpose is to find uh, the best weights uh, that optimize, uh, so they minimize the loss function. Essentially, starting from this error, you work back uh, through the network to adjust the weights using techniques like uh, gradient descent and backpropagation to find the optimal weights. That's what the training of the network is uh, doing. And uh, a bit more on terminology. So when we pass the uh, full data set once through the network, we call it an epoch, one epoch. And then uh, you can break down the data set into several uh, batches. And uh, we talk about batch size, so how many data points we give uh, each time and how many iterations we need to complete uh, one full epoch. And people can uh, also decide to run multiple epochs, so carry on with the training. OK. Moving towards uh, neural networks for uh, natural language processing applications, uh, there is a family of neural networks called recurrent neural networks. Why do we need uh, recurrent neural networks? Because uh, there's some limitation with the standard vanilla neural networks, also called feedforward neural networks. The limitation is uh, that the input and the output is essentially fixed beforehand, it's defined in the architecture beforehand. Language uh, is a sequence, so we don't have uh, fixed size for language. We want uh, to be able to model sequences. And that's what recurrent neural networks uh, do. Recurrent neural networks are able to model sequences by essentially injecting some notion of loop uh, in the neural network process. So you have still inputs and outputs, but what happens in the middle, uh, it's kind of like a for loop if you want. If you unroll uh, the network, uh, so the, uh, what you see on the right hand side is equivalent to uh, this notion of for loop, but it's maybe more clear uh, why we are able to uh, model sequences. Basically, each input at a given time will affect uh, the correspondent output, but it, it will also affect uh, the future outputs, kind of like language essentially. So what you say depends on the previous words. Uh, recurrent neural networks, uh, yeah, they're fine, but there are also limitations with the recurrent neural networks. And in particular, there's a problem called the vanishing gradient. The vanishing gradient, uh, some people uh, describe it as uh, the network cannot really remember what happened long ago. Basically, when you work back uh, the errors using the gradient, um, the gradient gets so small that the contribution uh, is not propagated back. So to bypass the problem of a uh, vanishing gradient, uh, some smart people came up with uh, a uh, specialization of recurrent neural network uh, that is called long short-term memory. So this is still uh, a recurrent neural network type of uh, architecture, but they, uh, they introduce uh, some additional concepts. And uh, when you zoom in, uh, you know, the first time you look at it, it's quite complicated. Uh, there are notions of gates, uh, gates that you use to uh, model uh, what you can remember, what you can forget, and so on. 
and uh, we're not going into too many details. Whenever I try to, to look it up, you know, I, I don't remember everything by heart. Um, but it's nice to know that uh, you can uh, model uh, such a complex architecture with a bunch of uh, equations. Essentially, it's a short snippet on the, on the Wikipedia page for a long short-term memory. So it looks like a lot of stuff, but you can uh, break it down into smaller components. So uh, looking at things in practice, uh, let's say we have uh, a data set of uh, Shakespeare, the full work of Shakespeare, and now I want to build uh, an AI that talks like Shakespeare. And I want to do it uh, in Python. So working with neural networks in Python, there are many options. Uh, when you do machine learning in Python, so your, your first idea is let's use uh, scikit-learn, and there's a lot of support uh, for neural network uh, things in scikit-learn. Um, maybe not so much on uh, kind of customizing deep architectures. And probably for this reason, we have seen uh, in recent years uh, the development of a lot of uh, frameworks, uh, specialized frameworks for deep learning in Python, Tiano, PyTorch, TensorFlow, and I call them low level. We can discuss are they really low level. Uh, when I, what I mean by low level frameworks is you kind of need to get a bit more involved with the, um, with the details here. Keras on the other side uh, is uh, a bit more higher level, so kind of built on top of the others. And there are probably more that I'm, that I'm forgetting at the moment and uh, things are moving quite fast, uh, so you will see uh, things changing and mo more libraries coming up. Now looking at uh, Keras a bit more uh, into details, Keras um, was uh, initially developed for fast prototyping, so very simple and high level API, easy to use from, uh, from the user point of view, from the developer point of view. And you don't bother too much with the details. Essentially, Keras is built on top of uh, other frameworks. It can use any of those, Tiano, TensorFlow, um, CNTK, which is the Microsoft uh, Cognitive Toolkit, uh, as backend. It runs uh, seamlessly on, on the GPU if your uh, GPU supports the CUDA drivers. And this, long story short, it's just easier to start with. So that would be my suggestion. If you start looking at this type of uh, uh, neural network architecture, probably Keras will be uh, simpler to start with. So if I want to implement uh, the LSTM, uh, long short term memory uh, network, in Keras, I already have uh, everything uh, almost out of the box. So I give you here a couple of snippets. Uh, they're coming more or less uh, uh, from the Keras tutorial, just little, little tweaks. So you have the full code, uh, working code on the Keras tutorial. So we're working with sequential models. So we define the model as a sequential model, and then we simply add uh, a layer, which is called LSTM, that's already implemented in, uh, in Keras. And then there are, uh, you know, some details on the, on the size of the, of the layers, uh, kind of what kind of input uh, we expect and so on, and uh, finally a dense layer to aggregate everything together. Once you define uh, the network, the next step would be uh, to write some additional configuration. You need to define uh, the optimizer. There are many options for the optimizer. You need to define uh, what kind of uh, objective function uh, you want uh, and so on. After the configuration, so you model the network, you configure the network, and then you can uh, train the network. Training, uh, the API follows more or less uh, what you have in, uh, in scikit-learn, so you always have fit and predict, um, x and y for, uh, for input and output. Uh, and then after the training, the training will take uh, minutes or days, depending on the uh, architecture of the network and on the size of the data set. After the training, you can uh, serialize the model, so you can save the model on disk, and you can resume the training later. So if you have more data coming in later, you can carry on with the training. Saving the model, uh, if you remember the talk from, uh, from yesterday on transfer learning, uh, training is what takes a lot of time, and then uh, the prediction is kind of uh, on the in real time happening on the spot. So spend a lot of time training, serialize the model, and then you can reuse the model later for prediction. And in terms of prediction, uh, so I have an expected, uh, some sort of expected size for my output. I want to say, uh, I don't know, 50 characters or 
1000 characters, whatever you want. And I make predictions. Here I'm using a uh, character-based model. So the predict function will take uh, some sort of seed text, some input, like a little prompt, and then we'll carry on uh, predicting the next character. And you sample the characters until uh, you build uh, your uh, generated text. To give you a flavor of uh, what happens here in terms of uh, output, remember we have uh, the full work of Shakespeare in uh, input. And uh, that's how the output looks like after uh, the first epoch. So that's the, uh, the first line uh, is the, the seed text. So I give uh, a random chunk of Shakespeare to the network and then I see how the network predicts the next character and it looks like the random monkey here. So a sequence of random characters. So nothing makes sense. Uh, after a few epochs, still uh, nonsense, it doesn't make any sense, but what I see is that the uh, text uh, starts getting into shape. So I see words, uh, you know, the, the size of the word makes a bit more sense. The punctuation starts kind of being in place, if you want. We're still far from real text, but, you know, it's slowly getting there. So I keep going, more epochs. Uh, after a lot of time, uh, uh, still nonsense. So yes, I have words. Every now and then you see a little uh, uh, English word like my or so, something very short typically. Uh, yeah, we don't have any Shakespeare yet. So here is when we take a step back and uh, we do some tuning. Tuning, so people who work in neural network would call it tuning. I'm not a neural network expert, so essentially it's try and error uh, for me. What do you do with tuning? Typically, try with more layers, or try changing the size of the layers, so put in more nodes. Do you need more data? Do you need any combination of this? So a bit of try and error until uh, you find something interesting. So what I've done uh, later, uh, I uh, stacked a few extra layers. There's a nice blog post that is referencing uh, at the end of the slides, uh, describing uh, a, uh, a nice architecture with four layers. And this is what happens with my new architecture. So after one epoch, I still have uh, a bunch of nonsense, but it's already looking like, uh, you know, looking from a distance, it looks like real words in terms of size, uh, spacing, the um, punctuation, a couple of random English words like my. <laughs> so we're starting a little bit better than before. I can keep it going and uh, much, much later, uh, yeah, now it's, look, uh, it's looking uh, much better. So it looks a bit more like uh, proper English. And uh, if you try to read it, you know, it sounds maybe a bit uh, intellectual. So it's kind of like Shakespeare. So we got there. Now wrapping up, uh, um, when you work with uh, this type of uh, models, uh, first of all, uh, they're slow. So you're likely to need uh, a GPU. Just to give you an example, when I did some of my first uh, uh, experimentation with a tiny model and a tiny data set, uh, it was taking uh, one hour and a half on my laptop, so 90 minutes. I throw it on the cheapest uh, AWS uh, GPU instance, and it was taking four minutes. So it's a uh, 22, 23 times uh, uh, faster kind of a, uh, training. So what I like to do usually, develop locally with a tiny data set, I make sure that the end-to-end -end pipeline is all wired up and it's working properly, even though I don't expect any correct output. I just want to make sure that from an engineering point of view, the end-to-end -end pipeline is fine. And then I throw it uh, on uh, a GPU machine. Uh, in terms of data set, uh, you will need, if you go for this type of character-based uh, language models, you will need at least one million characters in, in input. One million characters is it's a tiny data set, it's like one megabyte. Uh, the Shakespeare data set, the biggest one that you can find online, is about four and a half million characters. So still, you know, very, very small. And in terms of training, uh, as a rule of thumb, just as a rule of thumb, people seem to agree that you need uh, at least 20 epochs before you see something meaningful. So in the first uh, couple of epochs, there, there's just nonsense. After five, six, maybe you see randomly some uh, correct word. After 20 plus epochs, you will see uh, proper English, probably. 
And finally, once again, you know, it takes uh, a long time to uh, train, so remember to serialize the model, save it. It's the second time I tell you, so now you know that I forgot to save the first time. Um, and then you can reuse the model um, for uh, for the predictions. And uh, wrapping up, uh, well, I like uh, natural language processing applications. So if you are if you never seen any NLP before, I hope uh, you have uh, now um, you're curious about uh, trying out uh, some NLP. Uh, you don't need to jump straight into the complex uh, neural network architectures, and there's always a discussion on the trade-off between uh, simple models, counting words, and uh, the complex models. Uh, I still use uh, you know, engram-based simple models uh, quite often. They work very well if I, if I need to build uh, spell checkers, autocomplete, and whatnot. Uh, but it's, it's nice to have the option. And uh, if you're just starting with neural networks, my suggestion would be uh, start with Keras because the API is much simpler. It will make uh, your life easier, more high level. And finally, just to mention, a lot of try and error, if, like me, if you're not uh, a neural network uh, person. Um, the slides are on my speaker deck. Uh, if you want to make some noise on Twitter, and uh, I'll be around for the rest of the day if you want to talk with me later. Um, thank you very much. Go ahead. Uh, did, you, did you try this out with uh, larger data sets than you just did? Did you try with larger data sets? Yeah. Um, so the, the, the Shakespeare data set is kind of the, the hello world uh, nowadays. Um, yeah, so the business domain is important. So what, what I notice is whenever I use uh, uh, other data sets, the, um, the neural network uh, type of approach will uh, pick up uh, aspects of the, uh, of the domain. So I've used it not only for, uh, for natural language, but for something a bit more structured as well, uh, like recipes, uh, um, even uh, source code. Uh, uh, so you will find uh, the output uh, uh, being kind of similar to, to the input depending on the, uh, on the domain. I haven't gone uh, with uh, huge data sets, as in uh, terabytes. Um, probably you don't need even uh, this type of huge data sets. But yeah, what in terms of data set, what I would say, um, the domain is probably more interesting than the size, because the network will pick up on the domain, on the topic, on the, on the slang, uh, on the structure, and so on. So did you make fake forecasts for weather? <laughs> no, I didn't make fake forecast. Uh, no, I, I did work in, in fake news, but on, on, on the good side, on, on the good side. Yes? So what, what's the advantage of doing a character-based training as opposed to a word-based training? So uh, character-based versus word-based. Uh, uh, the advantage that I notice for um, for the neural network approach is that you capture the morphology a bit met better. So with word-based, uh, you are basically predicting the next word, uh, but you miss out on uh, things like uh, capitalization of the words, um, punctuation, uh, sometimes singular, plural, these kind of things. Uh, on a character-based uh, model, uh, the network seems to uh, pick up this type of aspects. Also, uh, in the Shakespeare example, uh, the name of the character uh, um, speaking essentially is always uh, spelled out uh, all capital. So you see, you know, the, the character name, uh, Hamlet uh, and whatnot, being all capital, and then what they say uh, as a regular lowercase or capitalized text. So I would say morphology uh, is something that you can pick up. I still use uh, word-based uh, uh, models a lot. Um, Depends on, I guess, what you're doing at the end of the day. Yep. At first, we talked about summary generation. Uh, what are the main ideas behind that? Because we understood how we can generate some text with uh, certain processes, but I guess summary generation is other type of uh, work. Can you explain us? 
Yeah, some, so about uh, summary generation. Uh, the idea is that you have uh, a lot of text uh, and you're not going to read all of, all of it. So you want to uh, extract the most important information here. Um, I would say a summarizer is probably a more complex system. It's not just predicting the next word. It's also about giving the importance uh, of the input. So you, you could use uh, frequencies to say, you know, you have many documents and they all talk about the same concept. So that's probably important. Then depending on the type of summary, um, you may want to give different ways to uh, things that are more frequent or more rare. So if you want to just report uh, the news, probably what everybody is saying is going to be more important. If you want to uh, summarize uh, a bunch of reviews, maybe you want to go in the other direction, so kind of contrast uh, different opinions. Um, it's about making a long piece of text uh, shorter, but still preserving the information. So there's also a lot of work uh, there being done uh, from the information theory point of view. Uh, Thank you. So there is something I missed in the introduction of Marco in the beginning. So Marco is one of the leads of the PyData London community. It's the largest PyData community in Europe. They have, in the, in the world actually, they have over 8,000 members and they run conferences with over 200 people every month. So that's a lot of uh, work on their shoulders. And so if you are in the London area and you want to attend, speak, or like join the community, uh, you can talk to Marco. They're awesome. <laughs>